It is but an infant here. Navigating it in places requires baby steps. Soon though, it grows in size and might. It is always changing. Welcoming one minute, wicked the next. It is loved and it is feared. It's been channeled by man, but will never be fully tamed. It has long carried much of the nation's freight, and so too its music. It is America's spine, its lifeblood. The Mississippi River is living, breathing history. We aim to see it by canoe. giant Charles Dickens once described the Mississippi as a slimy monster, hideous to behold, running liquid mud, he said. Perhaps Dickens would have thought differently had he visited the Mississippi's headwaters at Lake Itasca, Minnesota. The water here is clear and inviting. Here we are, headwaters. This is where we begin our journey to the Gulf well over 2,000 miles away. Ceremony is our first order of business. Here at its source, you can cross the Mississippi on foot by way of a rock path. Should they choose, family and friends can watch from afar by way of a webcam that's always on. For its first 60 miles, the Mississippi heads north while bending east, meandering through thousands of acres of marshlands and bogs, so expansive in spots, you can easily lose the channel. But the reeds obey the current. They point the way, so we follow. These boats are 18 feet, six inches long, and some of the channels, if you can call them channels we were in, were that maybe 20 feet. So we're doing hairpin turns with these boats. So it was, it was sl very slow. Tim Clark grew up in central Illinois with farm boy skills that grew into a wealth of outdoor knowledge. He is our navigator and also our cook. Yes, we are all here again, once again with dinner. Yes, we'll get some pepperoni, some beef. His Julia Child impersonation aside, Mr. Clark makes a mean camp pizza. He is partial to onions and garlic. His Irish stew and tuna burgers ensure we will not go hungry. After a hard day paddling, what more could you ask for? Well, maybe a cold beer, but... Tom Lobaz is a retired utility company construction foreman. He knows how to build things and fix them if they break. Tom is also a Purple Heart Vietnam veteran and has brought with him dozens of stars he's cut from retired American flags. He will present them to veterans we meet along the way. It's Tom's mission to say thank you for your service. Welcome. When I came home from Vietnam, there were no parades. There were no thank yous. We were just thrown back into uh, everyday life, and it bothered me. And for the longest time, I couldn't talk about it. But as time went on, I realized that I needed to. So I have come up with these little embroidered stars uh, that I want to give to every veteran that I meet. And uh, I want to shake their hand. I want to give you a handshake, but I'd really like a hug. Oh, I <laughs> there will be many of these moments, sobering and heartfelt. They give our journey far greater meaning and purpose.
Bill Barr is a retired high school orchestra director, a master of the violin. The rhythm of his music translates into how he paddles, steady, powerful. We nickname him the Mad Paddler because he never seems to tire in pursuit of adventure. Ever since I was a young child, I've loved being outdoors in, in this kind of adventurous mode where you're just exploring. And that's what paddling down the river and you're thinking about, oh, wow. They did this 200, 300 years ago, just like this, in canoes with paddles. And that's just kind of neat. That sense of history and adventure drives each of us. I'm a retired Chicago TV news reporter who grew up in Rock Island, Illinois, which is on the Mississippi. But I always took the river for granted, never really explored it. Perhaps this trip, in a way, is a means to right that wrong. We camp at rustic sites with names like Coffee Pot Landing and Fox Trap. We follow a river that twists and turns and sometimes compels you to duck. There's plenty of deadfall. It's a good thing that Tim, our gear master, has brought along a bow saw and a hatchet. Three days in, we arrive in Bemidji, a town that has long proclaimed itself to be the home of Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox. Paul stands 18 feet tall here. Legend has it that the Mississippi was formed when a huge cask Babe was carrying sprang a leak and the water rolled all the way to the Gulf. Before it follows Babe's trail to the Gulf, the Mississippi traverses three lakes, three large lakes, Bemidji, Cass, and Winnebagashish. Each can be friendly if the weather wishes it so. Our weather is fickle. Sun one minute, rain the next, wind always it seems. Finding where the river exits the lakes is not always easy against huge shorelines. The compass is important. As we depart Cass, a church congregation arrives for a Mississippi River baptism. We pause our portage to witness. The driving rain matters not. The last of the three lakes is Winnebagashish, Lake Winnie, 57,000 acres, notoriously temperamental, a four-hour crossing as the crow flies, but getting caught in the middle when the wind kicks up is a death sentence. All four of us have considerable canoeing experience, but we're no match for the wind. We opt to stay close to the shoreline. No matter, the wind arrives. 20 to 30 mile an hour gust. And I thought, well, this is gonna be a piece of cake. <laughs> Not today. It's a crosswind, we're getting pounded. Our arms are like noodles. At the lake's southernmost point, we say, enough, fight another day. As the wind blows, we surrender to Denny's Resort, where the sign tells us that guests here become lifelong friends. We don't know it yet, but that sign will speak volumes about our journey. We are guests about to meet many people along the Mississippi who will treat us as only friends can. Pat and Rhonda Rooney are former Chicagoans who moved north to run this fishing resort nearly two decades ago. We are treated to an abundance of Memorial Day food and the warmth of their hospitality. Pat proudly reminds us it's called Minnesota Nice. That's what they call it up here. Everybody's willing to help everybody out up here. That's really a fact. What we'll discover over the many canoe miles ahead is that Nice is not defined by state boundaries. It flourishes everywhere. We've brought with us a ceremonial paddle to be signed by all the river angels we'll meet. Pat, Rhonda, and friends are among the first. We are gifted with the best of human nature and the best of mother nature. Loons offer up the music of their tremolos.
trumpeters perform a flyby. Folks command their baker's dozen to follow the leader. Don't stray, the kids obey. On occasion, we slip into stealth mode. Apologies for intruding on the beaver's breakfast. Nice to see you having a good day. I guess you don't want to talk about it, huh? Mm. Creatures on the banks are no doubt curious about our passing, as is a river otter pup who decides to check out the two yellow canoes. See you later. Up above, this is our constant treat. Eagles, everywhere. They don't like to pose for an approaching canoe, but occasionally exceptions are made. Oh, we want to see your bottom. Come on, turn around. There you go. They soar with such great majesty. They're so graceful. They look so stately when they're just sitting in the tree. And then when they take off, it's like they have all the power. It seems like they control the world. They're no longer endangered, commonly seen, but we choose not to consider their presence commonplace nor do others. You love your job, don't you? <laughs> I love my job. I mean, just look around us. Uh, Rolf Thompson is the executive director of the National Eagle Center in Wabasha, Minnesota. The center opened here in 2007 at a spot on the Mississippi where eagles would always congregate in winter, even when they were few in number. The mission here is to teach about the culture, the history, the biology, the majesty of the eagle. That is some rabbit that I just gave her. This is Angel. She's 18 years old. At the time of our visit, she is one of six eagles cared for at the center. All six have various injuries that would not permit them to survive life in the wild. In captivity, they may live into their 30s and have become educational ambassadors for their human visitors. They refer to it here at the center as the nose to beak experience. Even though uh, the bald eagle has made a tremendous recovery uh, in terms of its population. They still attract people and uh, it's still every, everybody who comes here will tell us uh, their own personal eagle story of, uh, you know, the inspirational sighting of an eagle. That's, that's part of why it is so meaningful um, for, for everyone. We learned that the full force of the grip of an eagle's talons is 400 pounds per square inch. The human fails in comparison. I'm not even 10. You're not worthy. I am not worthy. Oh, I am not worthy. What we are seeing as we paddle is wildlife in abundance. Well, it's not just the eagle, it's cormorants, it's pelicans, it's almost everything. Mike Chikanowski grew up on the Mississippi. From his hometown of Winona, Minnesota, he has watched the river change. Boy, spring and fall here, uh, it's just like an African uh, trip, you know. I mean, you, you, cormorants come through maybe 50,000, or uh, flocks of pelicans, a thousand big, or, I mean, it was just, the wildlife has come back in the last couple of decades. The river, people think it's a dirty, muddy river. We're still in a little bit of high spring water and the rains will muddy it up. But in the summer, that river right here is almost crystal clear. So, I mean, yeah, the river is cleaner than a lot of people think. Mike built his first canoe at 15. He's built many, many more since as the owner of Winona Canoes. Tom and Bill own the two that were paddling south. They're light at 42 pounds, a good thing for those long portages. North of the Twin Cities, there are a dozen dams that require a go-around. 
The Portage in Grand Rapids, the proud home of Judy Garland and the annual OzFest, is at least 12 football fields long, much of it on city streets. The locals can no doubt say, there goes another nut wearing a canoe on his head. At least they have ice cream here. Cohasset, Brainerd, Little Falls, carry those packs, boys. Then there's Blanchard Dam near Royalton, one if not the tallest dam on the Mississippi. Up and down hills and through the woods we go to make it around. Breathe deep. Damn, that two-ton kitchen pack. The map lists a 300-yard portage at St. Cloud, but the sign says twice that. Oh, come on. Oh, well, the agony is brief, a small price to pay for the beauty we find. It calms the soul, and it's just peaceful, it's quiet. Yeah, you're fighting mosquitoes and bugs and everything, but that's par for the course. Yes, we do find mosquitoes, or more accurately, they find us. Our lives have slowed way down. We move, after all, at a five mile an hour pace. Plenty of time to think about anything and everything. Reflections, things that we take for granted, gives you a chance to sort of think about those, maybe reminding you of your loved ones, and those that have passed before us. We've set an itinerary that will have us on the Mississippi for 71 days, give or take a few. Our math skills, which we'll later erode, lead us to conclude that given our pace, it'll take 950,000 paddle strokes each to reach the Gulf, give or take thousands. It seems that almost every day we meet people who are not only interested in what we're doing, but are eager to help. Do you need water, supplies? Hop in, I'll give you a ride into town and back. They can't do enough for you, I mean, They'll take you here, they'll take you there. We are social creatures and the people make it all. Wildlife is wonderful, uh, wildlife has its own magic, but it's the people that make it truly. All the river angels that we meet, we want to sign our ceremonial oh, panel. So we would just appreciate so it if you would do that for us. I'm not the first one and only? Oh. There are some relatives among our river angels, but most are total strangers who expect nothing in return for their kindness, except perhaps a thank you. In our hearts, you'll always be number one. <laughs> <laughs> our ceremonial paddle is filling up fast. And speaking of filling up. Getting ready for hamburgers. Our fishing has been unsuccessful. So we're forced to eat cow. And as you can see, it's hard on us. It's very hard on us. As tasty as the chef's campground delights may be, we often opt, when we're able, for the local diner and a taste of small town America. Like the Palisade Cafe in Palisade, Minnesota, population 167, where for winter fun, they race toilets mounted on skis. There's nothing like having more food than you need, especially when it tastes so good. Cafe owner John Cannon tempts us with more, the ultimate VLT. A pound of bacon, tomatoes, toast, held together with a big steak knife, $11.99. It ranges anywhere from anywhere 23 to 25 pieces of bacon. Your tomato, lettuce, your fries. A lot of people eat it. This may be, but we really need to escape before we yield to temptation. By our 19th day, we've paddled just short of 500 miles as we approach Minneapolis-St. Paul. The Mississippi is changing character. It's bigger, more powerful current, more recreational boats, more industry, but no less wind. It is our constant nemesis. 
We take a day off the water and visit Upper St. Anthony's Lock and Dam. The lock chamber is empty of water now. Upper St. Anthony's was permanently closed in 2015 to check the northern migration of the invasive Asian carp. We're quite aware as we head south through St. Paul that we're now in barge country. The typical tow will be pushing 15 barges, three across, five deep. We see them, but it's not always easy for them to see us. Hard to see little people. We, we know where we're at all the time, constantly, but we, it's hard to see a little bit, and you're just a little bitty blimp on the radar. Just you, 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 you glance away one second, you might miss you. We keep our distance. They do kick up awake, but nothing like the rollers will experience from barge traffic south of St. Louis. From Minneapolis to Alton, Illinois, there are 29 locks and dams on the Mississippi. Most of them built in the 1930s as part of the Army Corps of Engineers mandate to maintain a nine foot deep channel for commercial navigation. The barges must use them, so too do we. We'd like to lock through. Tom has a marine radio that he uses to contact the lock master. When the light goes green, it is time to enter. It's a tad intimidating to be in a canoe pulling into a lock chamber. It's like a big bathtub. The drain's going to be open and we're going to be lowered as the concrete walls will grow higher above us. What's the drop here? Right now, a well, normal drop is 12 foot. We're going to be dropping about 8 foot today. Okay. Uh, hold on for dear life. Ropes are dropped. We hold. Down we go. It doesn't take long. The water is gravity fed through giant tubes to the downriver side. The lock gates slowly open. A horn tells us we're good to go. If there's no other traffic, we often lock through in no time. But there are occasions when we must wait in line if we don't portage around, for commercial traffic has priority. But we're retired, and waiting gives us a chance to marvel at precision. The lock chambers are 110 feet wide. Three barges abreast measure 105 feet. That's fitting a hand and glove with significant consequence if there's pilot error. The captain relies on his deckhands, who tell him by radio where to line it up. They start talking to me about 800 foot above, they tell me, they're my eyes and ears. They tell me exactly where I'm at, how wide I am off the wall, when I got a line across, then I can start hearing stuff myself. I can hear that line working when I'm working, but we don't break the line. They're very good at it. Some pallets are a lot better than others, but like I say, it's just years and years of training. It's the tow captain's job to know this river inside and out. What is essential for us are Army Corps of Engineers navigational maps. They are our Bible. They show us mile markers, where the main channel is, where those tricky wing dams sit. The river is so wide now with so many back channels, it's quite easy to get lost. This is the Driftless Zone, where the bluffs rise high. The river basin is immense, miles wide, magnificent beauty. It's called the Driftless Zone because ages ago it was left untouched by the glaciers and their drift. But this river valley was formed by the glacial melt, and the river was actually wide as these bluffs There are so many moments on this river when we feel small. We feel very small here. And there are many moments when we feel challenged, especially by the wind. It's so strong as we head to Linksville, Wisconsin, the boys lash the canoes together. It's a wise decision. Without our outrigger design, it's a fair bet we would have swamped. Love those Boy Scout lashings. We're aiming
aiming for a red and yellow building that turns out to be the Dog House Depot, where the owner and fine cook is Kim Schneiden, who hails from Davenport, Iowa, which is just across the river from my hometown. We keep encountering these unexpected small world connections, even while greeting riverbank campers. Beauty day. We're uh, heading down to the Gulf of Mexico. Really? Yep. Tom Lopez, you son of a bitch. Yep, there's Gary Schilling, a friend of Tom's. Small world indeed. Hey, how are you doing? Take your boat, set up camp, and enjoy. The river gets in your blood. It's the freedom. It seems to be free. You know, there's no, no traffic cops out there, no, no red lights. You can just go and you meet wonderful people. I haven't seen yeah, you in a long time. Time. Like Andrew Kyle, yeah, Iowa a DNR bit, but... conservation officer who grew up on the Mississippi, knows it, works it, lives on it still. Andrew most definitely has the river in his blood. It is essentially the way I look at it. it it's a way of life for a lot of these, these folks, having the river. And sometimes uh, we take it for granted and uh, forget it's there, or we see an eagle and it's not as big a deal to us, but uh, I try not to forget that. At many of our stops, we meet people like Lois Gert, who grew up on the river, moved away, but was drawn to return. In the fall, it is just gorgeous, the colors. You just sit by the river and, and let your worries go down the river. That's what I do. It's Tuesday morning coffee for Lois and the ladies of Guttenberg, Iowa, a town with German immigrant roots dating back to the mid-19th century. Lock and Dam 10 would arrive much later. At the River's Edge Bakery, we enjoy pastry, coffee, and conversation with the ladies and owners Pat and Patrick Kennedy, who are originally from Chicago. After 32 days on the river, the mind can play tricks, or you believe as much. I look up to see what I think is a riverboat and wonder if we've crossed a time-space continuum. Thankfully, we've not. It's the Twilight, a modern-day riverboat that cruises the Mississippi and Upper Iowa. Still, the mind is tested as we're paddling toward Clinton, Iowa, where the Mississippi is four miles wide. We look ahead to see a small island that's populated by hundreds and hundreds of birds, gulls, cormorants, but mostly pelicans. A pelican rookery. We have an Alfred Hitchcock moment. Here we go. They are everywhere. The locals tell us the pelican population on the Mississippi has exploded in the last decade or so. One theory is that their arrival has followed the northern migration of a ready food source, Asian carp. After bird watching, lots of wind, waves, and a long portage on a 35 mile day, we're a tad low on energy. And our looks draw sympathy from lifelong riverman Jeff Stoller of Clinton. He treats us to dinner and suggests we need a tow to our campsite downriver. So we lose some strokes. But make some friends, have some laughs, and are reminded of an axiom that people on the river are always there to help. You're out here and you're at the mercy of whoever might come by at that moment, especially late in the day. You're out there and, and you go by and somebody's sitting along the shore and you can see they're in trouble. You go over and you pull them in. I don't, I don't care what it is. I mean, you just do it. Because someday that's going to be you needing that. Needing that, 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 you know. I'm not sure how we got pulling you guys, but, you know. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> Every river town is filled with history. LeClaire, Iowa is the boyhood home of Buffalo Bill Cody. And right there on the riverfront is the Buffalo Bill Museum, which celebrates the life of the Pony Express rider, scout, hunter, and Wild West showman who achieved incredible international fame. We decide to have our own show. Father and son make music together. 
Bill's son, Will, joins us for a Riverside concert at our campsite just upriver from the Quad Cities. We are joined by relatives and friends who bring milkshakes and pizza and pork chops and, well, how much weight can a canoe carry? We're about 860 miles in as we approach the Quad Cities. One of them is Davenport, the hometown of Vic Spiderbeck, one of the most influential jazz men of all time. Across the river is Rock Island, which happens to be my hometown. Legend has it that my great-grandfather swam across the channel here on a bet and won a barrel of beer. Don't know if that's true, but it's a good story. The memories are rich. We all got out of school to pitch sandbags during the great flood of 65. And it was a given that you'd head to the riverfront whenever the Delta Queen came to town. Pretty interesting history here, isn't there? There's everything here is history. That bridge was built in 1894 is when it was completed. The guy that built this, Majeski, built the Golden Gate Bridge. Time to go. As we lock through on 15, Nolan Anderson is talking about the government bridge which sits alongside Dam 15, the largest roller dam in the world. A short distance upriver is the site of the first bridge over the Mississippi, built by the Rock Island Railroad in 1856. The steamship Effie Afton later rammed it and the bridge burned down. The railroad hired a lawyer named Abe Lincoln who argued that railroads had the right to build bridges over navigable waterways. The railroad won. Into each canoe trip, a little rain must fall. Actually, some days bring a lot of rain. We seek cover when we must, but push on when we can. Passing through Muscatine, where, at the dawn of the 20th century, muscle fishermen known as clammers turned this town into the pearl button capital of the world. The Mississippi gave birth to towns on its banks, it has also strangled the futures of many, like tiny Keithsburg, Illinois, where floodwaters defy levees and over time have taken their toll. Empty storefronts, population loss. John Johnson, who farms outside Oquaka, understands it. You know, I think we're holding our own right here. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't see it growing, you know, and that's unfortunate, but, but maybe that's also what helps keep its character too. You know? Whatever the hardships, towns up and down the Mississippi remain forever proud of their heritage. It was here in Little Oquaka in 1858 that Abraham Lincoln warned of a house divided. It was a time when the Mississippi was filled with riverboats. Murals like this one speak to river towns connecting with their past. It's true in Oquaka, it's true in Alton. It's true much further south in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, where an 1,100-foot section of the city's flood wall is an artful walk through history, from Lewis and Clark to the present. And it's true way south in Vicksburg, Mississippi, where history is the fabric of being. We're heading to Fort Madison, about to go under the longest double-deck swing span bridge in the world. We time our passage to feel the energy of a train a few feet overhead. see every day, an engineering marvel. The same is true for the Keokuk Power Dam. When it opened over a century ago, it was the largest electricity generator in the world. It still operates right next to Lock and Dam 19. This is the biggest single drop on the Mississippi. We're going down. For every foot of drop, 1.2 million gallons of water are drained from the lock chamber. There's a lot to be drained. We drop 31 feet. There's that feeling again that we're pretty small. We hear the music before we see the town. Hannibal Moe, hometown of Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain. The boat is the Mark Twain. There is a Mark Twain dinette, Mark Twain chicken, Mark Twain beer, and of course, the Mark Twain Museum. 
And why not always celebrate a literary giant who taught us more about the Mississippi than Tom and Huck could ever imagine? We dropped our paddles, went down on our knees, crouching, clutching the sides, crying for help. Nobody answered, no one was in sight. Twain was such a prolific storyteller and author of great quotes, he's often credited with sayings he didn't write. But this is his, always do right. This will gratify some people and astonish the rest. I just think that's a, a, just a wonderful quote, uh, the way we should live, you know? I don't think it should be a surprise to anyone. We're here during the 62nd annual Tom Sawyer Days, which features some intense competition in fence painting and frog jumping. For Mr. Clark, it's a chance to connect with family. They offer mixed reviews of his facial hair. For all of us, it's a chance for simple joy at the sight of a white picket fence. By the time we've reached Alton, we've paddled 1,100 miles. Here we pass through the last, the biggest, and the newest of the locks, Mel Price Lock and Dam. The wide Missouri joins just up ahead. We are forewarned to be very careful in the port of St. Louis. More barges, much bigger barges. All is okay as we approach the gateway to the west. Beautiful day, wonderful feeling. We stay only briefly, for this is a long paddle day, and we find immediately that caution means put your game face on. tough to tell who's docked, who's moving. Do they see us? Hope they see us. Yeah. Good, good, good. The river is rocking. Good, good. This is but a taste of what's to come. Yep. This guy's moving too, right here. Fifty-five river miles south of the Gateway Arch, we are able to drift back in time to St. Genevieve, settled by French Canadians over 250 years ago. It's the oldest permanent European settlement in Missouri. Many of its older homes have been restored to their past grandeur. They, they do it because they want to preserve these old homes, and there's probably, uh, I think the last number I saw, there's like 130 homes that have been uh, restored one way or another from as early as 1820. Older than that, in the heart of St. Genevieve is a restaurant housed in what is the oldest brick building west of the Mississippi. Our riverfront accommodations, while not four star, do just fine. And we have more river angels who bring us breakfast and cure our faulty sense of direction. On the river, you go with the flow. The days are longer, 40, 50 mile days in high heat. Must keep going, we say to ourselves. Bill uses the music in his head. I don't know if it gives me strength, but it helps with the rhythm. So it's just kind of like you get into it and you, you're just listening to this music inside your head and it's just, you go somewhere else. Still, we find ourselves in a hypnotic paddle that wants to induce sleep. Not good. We don't want mistakes. Here is a mistake. Just north of Cairo, the tow Eric Haney apparently clipped a hidden wing dam and sank a couple days before we passed. The crew got off okay, but the boat didn't do well. We are now wide awake. A short time later, we arrive at the site of Old Fort Defiance the southernmost point of Illinois, where the Ohio, a river with greater volume than the Mississippi, joins to make an even bigger Mississippi. We are 47 days and over 1,300 miles in, although this sign is our reality. We've stayed at state parks, county parks, empty lots, and behind a biker bar. We've commandeered city riverfronts with permission for the most part. 
Our campsites seem to never be far from trains that pass through our tent at all hours. No train here, but we're so close to River's Edge that exiting the wrong tent door would mean an immediate bad, which is not a bad idea since we graybeards are looking bad and smelling worse. We've had our fill of oatmeal and granola, sausage and crackers, but we remain inspired by centrifugal force coffee. Mr. Clark swings his discolored pot precisely 21 times to achieve proper camp brew. I've, I've lost my count now. I gotta start over. 14, 14. No worries with too many swings. 22 produces decaf. At 30, maybe an adult beverage. The coffee is on. As we begin the lower Mississippi, we borrow a bit of inspiration from people we've already met. So you gotta ask yourself why. It's all inside, it's all created inside. Veteran cyclist Mark Trail, who's doing 8,500 miles triple crisscrossing the country. 18 year old Stephen Blackwell, who's crossing the states to raise money and awareness for first responders. How many miles are you doing today? 140. You are a crazy man. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Larson, who built his own boat to tour the Mississippi. Vietnam veteran Jim Prigler, who paddled the Mississippi to honor and assist Gold Star families and Mike Garland, who did the same for the fight against cancer. All of theirs are solo adventures, remarkable, and something else. It seems that every time we paddle up to a town, there's someone there to meet us. It's never planned, it just happens. And at the top of the boat ramp in New Madrid, Missouri, is Jerry Whitehead. Like Tom, Jerry is a Purple Heart Vietnam veteran. His medals today are proudly displayed at the town visitor center. But when he came home to the States from Vietnam, Jerry, like Tom, was met with disdain or at best <laughs> indifference. I wanted to go buy civilian clothes so I wouldn't stand out. I know. And as soon as I got in civilized place, I bought civilian clothes and hung it all, hung the uniform up. That's a lasting hurt, but a simple act, a thank you from one vet to another, helps. New Madrid has a Veterans Memorial Park near the riverfront. Tom leaves a star. New Madrid sits at the top of a Mississippi oxbow, a huge loop in a river that has become immense. New Madrid also sits on something else, a fault. A series of three earthquakes here in the early 1800s were so powerful, they altered the course of the Mississippi. We need to alter the sad state of our laundry. It's been cooked to a certain aroma. We welcome the smell of spaghetti and meatballs. Very good. By the river. What we all find astonishing is that we can be paddling on this river for hours and hours and not see another human being. We do, however, Big see board. barges, lots of barges them. Barges at the most. This guy's pushing five across, six deep, 30 barges. 42 barges, biggest one yet. And this is a double barge. This is the first They are leviathans, and we must ride their rollers. Big boys, low in the water, pushing up river. Count the rooster tails. All that horsepower rocks the whole river, and you keep rolling, sometimes in four foot troughs and deeper, long after the tow is passed. Somebody suggested that we have a supply of Dramamine on hand. You just square it up and ride it out. And maybe just take a break from the barge dance. Yeah. 
We are reminded of this river's role in the Civil War, the battle for Island 10, the siege of Vicksburg, but other events lesser known. Just beyond that bluff ahead is the site of Fort Pillow, where historians say several hundred Union troops, most of them African-American, were shot and killed while surrendering. Seven miles north of Memphis, we pass the scene of the worst maritime disaster in U.S. history. The Steamboat Sultana was loaded with just released Union prisoners of war heading home. 2,300 on a boat with a capacity seven times less. The boiler blew, the Sultana sank, an estimated 1,700 lives lost. A tragedy overshadowed by the end of the Civil War and the assassination of Abe Lincoln 12 days earlier. Sobering history. As is our visit to the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, built around the Lorraine Motel, where Martin Luther King was assassinated nearly a half century ago. A day off the water. Music, barbecue, a bed and bath to help revitalize our brains and certainly our clothing, thanks in part to more River Angels. It is the home of King Biscuit, the longest running blues radio show in America, Helena, Arkansas. All the big names, all the really big names got their start right here. Helena, Arkansas back in the day was wide open 24 seven. If you wanted it, it didn't matter what it was, you could get it. These are tougher times for river towns, but Helena cherishes its past as a blues mecca, attracting the great names of blues and now celebrating that history with an annual blues festival that swells the town by 60 to 80,000 people. There are reminders of the past. Why, there's Buster Brown, he lives in a shoe. There's his dog, Ty, he lives in there too. We watch as snag boats keep the channel as clear as possible. Most of our nights now are spent on islands with names like Stumpy, Waterproof, 64. Or we plop at the top of boat ramps where barbed wire is a sufficient clothesline. We find it is not always a treat to beat your feet on the Mississippi mud. Come on, Paul. Current helps enormously. We're doing a lot of miles. The sun, though, is eating us up. We keep paddling, but our brains feel half-baked. We can't do arithmetic. I keep losing sunglasses. Hey, Tom, you see my sunglasses? It's a challenge to figure out where we are. We are parched when we arrive in Rosedale, Mississippi, a town once on the river, but over time, the river moved away. Mike Hudson and his wife Virginia save us with water, a ride into town for supplies and showers. Mike grew up on the river, moved away, but came back to stay. Absolutely, it's not only about the love of the sunsets, but it's the understanding of how majestic and how powerful. We're talking about a river that can flow as high as 2.6 million cubic feet per second. All that water comes from 31 states and two Canadian provinces, all within the Mississippi River Basin. It is, as Mike says, a river to be loved and feared. And his mention of sunsets, we were told before we launched that everywhere on the river, we would enjoy the spectacular. So true. to wait out a rainstorm before arriving in Vicksburg. This is the last port of call for Bill. We say farewell to the mad paddler who's heading back north. Like him, I should like the music in my head to keep the paddle going. 
We now transition to a 23 foot long canoe suitable for three, courtesy of Lane Logue, a river angel with an encyclopedic knowledge of the Mississippi. To Natchez we three paddle, a town of antebellum mansions, and at the top of a boat ramp called Natchez Under the Hill, we find the oldest saloon on the Mississippi, where visitors over the years have been forewarned to beware of pickpockets and loose women. We have people right here under the hill every week from at least five or six different foreign countries that come here, and they all have to come see this saloon right here. three now make a decision. The barges are constant. We know the traffic ahead is intense. The river is packed. Ocean going traffic, petrochemical plants, big boats everywhere. The stretch between Baton Rouge and New Orleans is sometimes referred to by barge pilots as Suicide Alley. Farewell. We choose to leave the Mississippi for the Atchafalaya River to the Great Gulf. River, great spirit. Farewell. Were it not for man's intervention with a floodgate system called the Old River Control Structure, the Mississippi quite possibly would choose to follow the Atchafalaya's shorter and steeper route to the Gulf. We lock through in one of the noisiest locks ever. We know that there's swamp wilderness on the other side and creatures. We have opted to engage gators instead of freighters. Yes, alligators, right away. We're curious. Mr. Clark in the stern moves slowly to get ever closer. Of course, he's 20 feet behind the guy with the camera. This is a bit different than interrupting a beaver's Northwoods breakfast. All good, he's seen enough. I'm reassured by Lane Logue's observation. They're scary, you know, they got big teeth, and, uh, uh, but they mainly leave you alone. Uh, you know, they're just scared, just like the old thing, you know, the, the, other, the other thing is more scared of you. But, uh, you know, you just gotta watch yourself around them. We hope this is true for those stealth approaches. We're traveling through the heart of Cajun country where we are met with hospitality and humor. About 140 miles on the Atchafalaya, past Simisport and Crot Springs, on the way to Morgan City, Louisiana, and the Gulf beyond. markers count us down. Finally, where fresh water and salt water mingle, we arrive. We've made it. In the Gulf of Mexico, over yonder, you are now free to let out appropriate war hoops and joy. <laughs> we have completed it. You ready, John? <laughs> oh, he's lost at sea. <laughs> we are tired and proud. Over 2,200 miles, 70 days, 900,000 plus strokes, but who's counting? We soak it in. Yeah, you made it. Captain Tommy is giving us a ride back to Morgan City because we sure aren't paddling back. We look back, realizing we have been blessed in many ways. We have learned a lot, enough to know that we know very little. We have seen the beauty of the river and felt its power. We may never again see most of our River Angel friends, 
but their kindness is forever etched in our memories. The people along the river from Itasca, Minnesota to Morgan City, the people are the same. They love the river, they respect the river, they give, they are most helpful. So that, that theme runs through it all. The things that we saw, the people we met, can't be replaced. Reaffirms your belief that there's a lot of good people out there. The reaffirmation of the goodness of people is our greatest treasure. That and the opportunity to see the mighty Mississippi by canoe.